Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, in my Redeemer. Amen. Every now in the lectionary, we get handed a group of readings for the day that have such obvious through line, such a clear through that it feels like the of the lectionary have just sort of handed us a sermon on a silver platter. Usually this happens in uh, the shorter seasons like Lent or Advent or on some of the feast days like Easter. Or... And then sometimes in the middle of the season after Pentecost, an ordinary time, the green season, on 16th Sunday after Pentecost, year A, proper 19, Mike? Hold, please. <laughs> Is this working? Hello? Yeah. Promise? OK. <laughs> so back to it. Every one of the readings we have today are all about one thing. And it's not even a little bit subtle, forgiveness. So I am picking up the breadcrumbs left by the curators of the lectionary. I am absolutely taking the bait. And we're going to talk about forgiveness this morning. I want to spend some time focusing on two of our readings, the Gospel and the Genesis reading, where we see two very similar stories, two portraits of enslaved men, Joseph and the servant of this king, who make very different choices when it comes to forgiveness. The subject of our parable is a man enslaved to a king who forgives him his, all his debt and then turns around and lords another's debt over them. This comes back to bite him in some pretty predictable and obvious ways, as anyone could guess, but it's the other story of an enslaved man, Joseph's story, that gives us some insight as to why. Joseph has spent decades of his life in the service of different masters. It's a line of bondage that has led him right to the top, becoming the second most powerful man in all of Egypt and giving him the power to enforce a grudge held over his brothers for selling him off into slavery originally. His brothers are absolutely right to fear him. They messed up, and they know it, and they know that he would have every right by the standards of their day and ours to refuse to help them in their time of need, to refuse to forgive them for what they've done, and refuse to let go of the past and make them pay for what they did. But he doesn't. I mean, we know the story, we just heard it. He makes amends with his brothers, he forgives them, he doesn't hold anything against them, and that when they fall down before him, proclaiming that they are willing to be his slaves, to be in the place where they put him all those years ago, he relents. But why does he do that? Sure, it's easy to say that he's learned his own lessons, he's done his own work, and something like that, maybe, that's true, but that's not the reason he gives. When his brothers submit themselves to him, willing to become his slaves, he says, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? I think that's the key here. The reason that Joseph was willing and able to forgive his brothers for the very real wrongs that they brought upon him was not because he was just a nice guy, but because he understood exactly who he was in light of who his God is. And the parable shows us the opposite view, where our indebted man, forgiven of his own debt, refuses to forgive a debt owed to him. And it's because he forgot or refused to acknowledge who he was in light of who his Lord was. His Lord was one who had forgiven him, and he turned around and acted as if that wasn't true. And I can speak only for me, but I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be genuinely grateful for the forgiveness God offers and grants to me, and then to find myself stingy with my own forgiveness, find myself unwilling to forgive and forgive and forgive for the same thing over and over and over again two, three, four times, let alone the 70 times seven I'm told to do by Jesus. And that's just the thing, isn't it? It doesn't feel like human nature to forgive and forgive and forgive. 
over and over. If I get hurt by the same person for the same thing more than once or twice, I'm likely to just move on from that thing or from that person. Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor, she's an Episcopal priest, she uses the example of two friends who have made lunch plans, and on the day that lunch is happening, one of the friends drives to the restaurant, parks, walks in, sits down, orders, and waits, and waits, and waits, and eventually she pays her check and leaves, understanding that she has been stood up for lunch. Later, the other friend gushes her apologies and says that she left her appointment book at home and completely forgot. Will you give her another chance, she writes. You put your feelings aside, of course you will. What is one missed lunch between friends? So you set another date, and the day arrives and the whole thing happens all over again. Forgiving someone once is one thing, but are you really going to set another lunch date? Are you really willing to go through this routine 70 times seven, or to be more specific, 488 more times, she asks? And honestly, no. That sounds exhausting. And like it hurts too much. It sounds like I'm being told to be a doormat, and I don't like that. I know for me, intentionally or not, there can oftentimes be this scoreboard in my head where I keep little tally marks for how many times I've been wronged or how I've been wronged. And if that reaches some certain non-specific number, I'm out. I don't want to do it anymore. I want the relationships and the interactions that are sort of cost efficient for me. I want something out of these relationships that is at the very least comparable to what I'm putting in. So I get where Peter's coming from when he asks what the limit for forgiveness is, and Jesus comes in with that frustrating 70 times seven, which is of course an impossibly high number and is effectively telling him that the limit isn't real and there ought to be no end to our forgiveness. And that's tough. And if we're reading this parable like a fable, like it's some weird little story with a moral lesson at the end of it, we end up with a reflection on the golden rule, right? do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Forgive someone because you want to be forgiven. But here's the problem with that. That's totally fear-based. If I only forgive someone because I want them to forgive me too, I'm operating out of a place of anxiety and worry, hoping against hope that they will forgive me too. I'm not really forgiving them. I'm just promising not to be mad about something to save my own skin. But if we look deeper at this parable past the golden rule reading, we see a king who had no reason to forgive and yet did, and a servant who lost his reason to hold a grudge and yet still held it. When we see it in light of Joseph's story, we start to understand that we can only give true forgiveness, real forgiveness, only take out the white ledger and the white out to the ledger and in a real way when we ourselves have experienced the true forgiveness in our own lives. Only when we know what it really feels like to have our records wiped totally clean, as if nothing came before it, to have our transgressions removed from us as far as the East is from the West, as our Psalm says, only then can we offer that true forgiveness to others. Anything else is a paltry imitation, trying to save our own skin or avoid a fight or hide our real feelings. That sort of forgiveness that isn't really real forgiveness at all, it's a form of avoidance that ends up slowly moving people out of our lives or us out of other people's lives until that already tenuous connection breaks and there's nothing left. How is that forgiveness? How is that a reconciliation or a restoration? Real forgiveness isn't just tiptoeing around the broken glass while it piles up, pretending it's not there. Real forgiveness is getting down on our hands and our knees, risking getting hurt and cleaning it up, even if we're the only one doing it. And I think we get to the point of accepting and giving this sort of false forgiveness because we forget what it means to be truly forgiven, or we act like we haven't been. Because when we remember what it feels like to be truly forgiven, to have our records expunged and any memories of the transgressions wiped away, how could we fail to pass that on? When we know and remember that there's nothing left 
Hold, please. When we know and remember what it feels like to be forgiven for real, we can't keep that from someone else because we know the freedom it offers. Freedom from the cycles of anxiousness and worry and avoidance that pass for forgiveness. And freedom into the service of a king who would offer us that true, honest-to-goodness forgiveness that holds not one thing against us. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? So says the king in our parable, and so says our God to us. Am I in the place of God? So says Joseph to his brothers, and so ought we to say to those who wrong us over and over and over again. The only reason we can even really want forgiveness or to forgive is that the relationship has to matter more than being right. That's the hardest thing about all this. We can be right, absolutely right, about being wronged or being owed or whatever, but the relationship has to matter more. Joseph had every right to hold his brothers to account, but the relationship mattered more. The king had every right to hold his servant to account, but the relationship mattered more. And our God has every right to hold us to account for our sins and transgressions, but the relationship matters more. The God who would come and live with us, die with us, rise up and promise us a restored life cares more about the relationship with us than anything we could ever do. This promise of forgiveness is because the relationship matters more. Now the heart and grounding of our ability to forgive, really forgive, is only in realizing that and remembering that and acting like that's all true because it is. Only in that can we forgive others as we have already been forgiven by the God who values being with us more than lording our sins over us, who would get down on his hands and knees and clean up the glass we shattered. It's only when we know this deep in our bones that we can offer a measure of the free grace and mercy that we've already been given to those who could never pay it back. It's only when we understand that we have been forgiven by the God to whom we owe everything, our life, our breath, our very existence, the one to whom we can never, ever pay it back, and the one who never asks us to. Only when we realize that our God has stopped keeping score, has never kept score, and just loves us because he loves us because he loves us, that can we stop keeping score and love others, forgive others too. So maybe the real golden rule isn't so much that we do unto others as we would have them do to us, but that we do unto others as God has already done to us. Amen.